Welcome, welcome to the session four, five, and six. Uh, the, we will have now the first of our uh, presenters. If, please correct me if I pronounce badly your name. Alok Srivastava. It's okay? I, thank you. So he will talking about the plotting synthesis of rubber and of DNA, how chemists use chemical structures and reaction pathways to craft new chemistries. You have 20, 25 minutes, enough time at least for some questions. Your Thank you. Session, um, a lot. Thank you. Hey, um, I mean, thank you for the committee for accepting my talk and thank you for the morning, the first three talks, they were very exciting. And some of what I have to say may bring some of the excitements back up. Okay, I guess, uh, Jose, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so I am an independent researcher in San Francisco. I have been um, working in the HPS field for six years um, and I have uh, had the privilege of, you know, sitting next to Eric Seri like six years ago at uh, like at a PSA conference. Uh, it was exciting to have him give the first talk. Um, and some of his concerns are also my concerns. So I want to claim that the HPS studies or philosophy of science studies in the context of the historical development of the sciences has this um, plot that has been growing, growing since Simon Shapin and Schaefer published their work. And you can say that, you know, there is this incompletely characterized dance between theory construction and the appearance of material-based methodologies, instruments that manipulate materials in specific material situations. So you have this tension between dematerialized, desituated conceptual structures and theory uh, discussion, and then how they are produced or interact with material-based practices in material places by materially bodied manipulators. And you could say that Shapin and Schaefer inaugurated this discussion, this discovery of the interaction. And we had other people who emphasized that thing knowledge, knowledge in material things and manipulating with instruments can be quite far away from theory and conceptual structure but is very effective um, and is often ahead of theoretical characterizations. And so thing knowledge is on more heavily on the material manipulation side, material actors can work with them and do things. And then you have the other characterizations like Ursula Klein's, you know, paper tools, that chemical diagrams are tools on paper that somehow interact with. So they're on the Northern hemisphere, right? The concepts, theories, uh, and then, um, and what we now have is people in the last, you know, eight years, Pamela Smith has like really produced these entangled itineraries that material practices, material discoveries in material places seem to propagate through material contact and produce a whole community of futures. And I wanna use that to say that what Schaefer and Chapin were talking about is the entangled itinerary between theory development and practices development, right? And I'm gonna claim that we have other studies in the last you know, 25, 30 years that go along with this pattern and particularly Hasek Chang's work would be, I would characterize it as trying to work out 
the itinerary between theory development and practices development, right? And same is true for both of his works are like that. And they're trying to figure out how does material-based practices stabilize theoretical inference making and how do theoretical inference making empower or expand the scope of material-based practices. And I have a conceptual diagram of this traffic, right? And what I would claim is that, okay, just a minute, I need to. Um, okay. That what you, so if you can say that in the case of inventing temperature, there was a long period in the 1700s of studying the differential expansion of different materials, trying to cross index them between you know, the conditions of heating, the different materials being heated, and you were able to somehow move that whole matrix of comparative examination into a standardization of the reference material, reference condition, and then the standardization of a device that had to be credentialed by the network of people who knew the uh, differential expansion of different materials and their numerical relationships. And then you got the standardized thermometers. So the standardized thermometers, standardized calibrated thermometers depend on an economy of material-based characterization and practices. And it is only then that you get a stabilized measure and concept of temperature, which then allows for more theory development and you get these PVT equations and theories of e heat. And so my biggest, my general claim is that the itinerary between theory and practice continues once theories have become effective and practices have become standardized. We still have to go and buy a standardized calibrated thermometer by the institutions and organizations that stand mm -hmm. on the th th three, dec three century stabilized set of practices. And um, only then do the temperature measurements in an equation and the, the reliability of the equation makes sense. And so I'm calling this the core regulation between situated conventions, right? So the blue dematerialized, desituated conceptual conventions uh, co are co-regulated with the standardized uh, reference material, reference conditions and things like that. So Jose, thank you for nodding. So it seems like I'm making sense. Um, yeah. And so going forward into the world of chemistry, if you look at the history of rubber synthesis, you know, sap of rubber plant somewhere in South Asia was noticed that it was being used when by heating as a rubber, uh, as, as some, a sheet that could have interesting properties. And then by the 1820s, the rubber sap could be separated. No, somebody, you know, not less significant than Faraday showed that there was a liquid separable from the sap that somehow had more of the property of producing the rubber sheet. And that started concomitantly with the uh, characterization and Lavoisier style characterization of plant materials and from people like Kekule. Basically that period, people try to figure out what was the Lavoisier characterization of this purified liquid, how many carbons there were, what was its composition. And in parallel in the industry, heating with the presence of sulfur, stabilizing the rubber, all of that process developed, but the lineage of chemists arrived at a characterization of this liquid, a chemical structure characterization, and that it had this interesting property of head to tail bonding so this was the first time polymerization was noticed, right? And then you could ascribe it to the isoprene structure. 
once you had this chemical structure characterization of what was in the liquid and how it produced the sheet material, you could now chart a path where petroleum that had become available could be used to produce isoprene molecules. And in the 1930s, you had completely synthetic rubber where the isoprene liquid did not come from purification methods, but from chemical synthesis methods. And so what I want to claim is that the primary practices of rubber tree sap being heated into rubber and then the purified single material liquid heated into rubber gave rise to this characterization, conceptual theoretical characterization of what's the structure inside this isoprene containing liquid and how its chemical structure allows for head to tail bonding between entities. And this empowered the, now you could get isoprene from other carbon sources. And so I'm claiming just, just as what I showed with inventing temperature that there's a similar economy of practices and an economy of dematerialized, desituated conceptual characterizations that together empower wider amounts of chemical structure generation from a wider amounts of source materials. And so you get the proliferation of paper tools and material situation based tools because you have, you have made this circuitry, the core regulating situated conventions work effectively and check on each other. So I'm just gonna look for a few nods. If this is still Olympia, Jose, is this still making sense? Okay, it may be controversial. You can <laughs> make me rewrite the paper again afterwards, but so far I'm creating good trouble, well, I hope. Well, we are, are leaving the, the, the questions for the end. So yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I have some, I have a question, but I will I, I would like that you close. Thank you, and thank then you, thank you. Thank you. I, I'm a little dependent on the nodding as you marked. Um, okay, it looks like my screen has frozen. Um, okay. Ah, there it is. So here I'm just going to present the story of uh, the key event in nucleotide, dinucleotide synthesis. So today we live in the age of DNA synthesis, synthetic biology, people can order 2000 nucleotide long pieces of DNA because automated synthesis has reached this level of sophistication. But back in 1955, um, where chemists have been working out, trying to investigate the structure of DNA and RNA for more than 20 years um, in a directed fashion. It was in 1955 that the first dinucleotide, dithymidine dinucleotide was synthesized. And what is interesting about that story is that in Alexander Todd's lab, they, 10 years earlier, they had basically decided to stop trying to characterize natural DNA in how it was structurally organized. The number of chemical possibilities of what would be the primary nucleotide structure and how it would get coupled to each between two nucleotides were too many. And so the uh, characterization only based approach proved to be unwieldy and Alexander Todd's lab decided that they would synthesize different types of dinucleotides and compare them with the degraded components of um, biological DNA. And they converged to the first synthesis of dithymidine with the particular linkage. And once they were able to demonstrate it in the lab from nucleotides that had not been made 
from biological materials. Had each nucleotide and its triphosphate structure had been, its, its um, active structure had been built in the lab. And then they built the dinucleotide and they basically then were able to demonstrate that what they had built in the lab through synthesis was equivalent and equally active as biologically derived material. And from that moment onwards, alternative ways of making the dinucleotide, turning the dinucleotide into a polynucleotide became the capacity of molecular, of, of, of the nucleotide chemists. And 15 years later, you know, you had the Corana lab produce the long piece of um, DNA and then automated synthesizers happened. And so again, what I'm claiming is that the interaction between chemists in the lab <coughs> with protocols to make stuff and the characterization of the theory of how bonds are formed and which uh, uh, bonding activities are more active played a joint role. And so I'm, yeah, so now I'm basically repeating, but that's my primary, um, okay. My slide process is a little bit, there we go. I'm just coming back to that. This is the economy of co-regulated situated conventions, which I am describing. And, and that's the end of the talk right now. I, um, and these are the people that I, I'm uh, grateful for, Dominic Berry and Mary Morgan from her group at the LSC, the Biological Engineering Collaboratory, Julia Burston and Mark Fedek, um, and the people in California, James Griesemer uh, and Elihu Gerson, and my partner who's my, also my sponsor for these studies. Um, Thank you very much, Alok. Thank you for your for your talk. And now this, will someone yeah. have questions? Anyone? In the, in the chat, I have the uh, uh, queue for a question, and all other people. Ah, okay. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to answer Olympia's question. Well, my my my. It's a comment. I don't know if I want to know if you are if you agree. I mean, uh, you are you are showing how a um, very general and, and phenomenological concept like rubber appears in the everyday life, and then when this began begins to enter in the scientific uh, uh, life, then scientists conceptualize that uh, that's concept I mean abstract that concept and that concept may change so I mean the the the, the definition of rubber changes so now you can have something that is artificial rubber because you have a, a, a chemical formula so you can go back, and find artificial rubber because you you know how to uh, synthesize it. So I mean that you are look you are showing how a concept begins at the phenologic, phenomenological level, then goes to the theoretical level, and this changes the definition of the concept, and so it modifies again the practices. My I, I think that it's. Okay, I mean, I think that it's it's perfect. And and uh, my question is, if um, the case of uh, Eric Serry about acidity cannot be thought in this sense, also. Yes. So so, so I, I I think you've um, you've gone to the core of the issue as to um, how does conceptual talk regulate practical work you know, and, and why is there any reliability between the two? And I think one of the things that I did not go into deeper grain about is, so 
if I bring us back to the rubber situation. The, it is easy to ask, how does this isoprene molecule structure represent? What is it representing about the isoprene continuing containing liquid? You know, so, so if you take Eric's stock and say, how does the log concentration of protons in water or hydrate uh, pro protonated water molecules? Or are we even talking about an actual material in the water? And is the instrument that is correspond, that was calibrated to, with the thought process that there are protonated water molecules present and the, what the instrument is measuring is the physical presence of those protonated. Um, so I think you can controversialize the two and say, is there, does this representation, like, so that whole debate about realism, is this representation correspondent with, um, is the double, does the double bond look exactly like the, what shows up in the molecule and can a single molecule electron microscopy experiment visualize the double bond? And I think you can controversialize things on both sides. And I, but I think the question doesn't go away. So what I'm claiming is what is worth keeping track of is how do effective conceptual structures collaborate with effective material practices and over a period of time, they refine each other. And I think something gets lost by specify stressing too much on is this conceptual structure a, rep, phys, a, a physical visualization or is this a paper tool that lets you get at a measurement that lets instruments do their work so so that's where i'm trying to move um maybe i have added more words to your questions and not resolved anything um, okay. There was one more hand okay. up. We yeah. have a, a, a question from Eric Sherry. Please, Eric. I, I, I or do, do you ask by yourself, Eric? So I, I was wondering about the, the relevance of the book by Shapin and Schaefer, or Schaefer and Shapin. Um, th that book is usually taken to mean the beginning of sociology of science. Those two authors claimed that it was because of the social conditions in England that this and that and that happened, as opposed to because of, of a more internal scientific issue. Um, but you seem to be using, you seem to be invoking that book in a different sense. And I'm just wondering, just maybe I didn't catch it. What is the relevance of that book? for your project. So you, you are quite uh, right that it's often characterized as uh, deflating or reorienting the power structure underlying what is uh, baptized as science, who can publish in the, uh, uh, who can publish in the official journals and, uh, and it is seen as having sacralized theoretical arguments rather than the uh, artisan in the workshop, the glass maker, the instrument maker. And so you could argue, so what I would argue is that while I'm not focusing on the social power structure, I am bringing in that the artisan who manipulates materials and figures out how to manipulate materials in new ways is contributing directly and in some sense equally to the larger economy of knowledge production. So you would, I would claim that the labs that figured out the isoprene rule were developing, were part of the, what Shapin and uh, Schaefer would call the underclass 
that were working with their hands, working with the materials, and the materials told stories that the theories did not know. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. Thank you. I love seeing the yeah. nodding head. It makes me feel a yeah. little safe. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're I... quite safe. Thank you. <laughs> We are quite far. Exactly. <laughs> I, 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 could I say something? Please. Uh, but uh, it's a problem of the way that we recognize the history of science that uh, giving too much importance only to theory. Uh, it's a problem of us. Not a problem of the way that science has been developed uh, in the last centuries. So in a way, I think that Simon and Schaefer emphasize the importance of the instrument because the vacuum pump creates, in a way, the vacuum. And vacuum was something uh, absolutely new at that moment. And, and was not an uh, ethereal, hypothetical entity, was there. They produce it. Yes, and, and I, Jose, thank you so much. Um, I, I think the way you just posed it, it's important to demarcate that. Let me just bring up that slide. The devising of an air pump, which you could verify had emptied out the air from the place being held, right? Mm -hmm. That created a crisis for explanation. Yes. And I think that is where what I'm after is that in this economy between the two sides, that one creates the crisis for the other. If theory has three, four, five ways to go, then it needs to be resolved by doing experiments. Mm -hmm. And then there are times when the material capacities of the manipulator create crisis for explanations. And so there is this core regulation of these stabilized conventions between the two. Okay, sorry because, sorry, appears to be a, a question of Michelle. Yes, long, please. Long time ago. Yeah, I was waiting for Michelle to. Yes. Please, Michelle. It, it's okay, actually it follows on from the discussion. So, so you talk about economy between the two sides, between the theoretical and the practical side. Do you just mean exchange of ideas or do you mean something more I mean, economy is normally about the management of scarce resources and efficiency and so on. I don't understand the use of the word economy here. Well, so, so I will use economy the way people might, you know, that if you read the first two, three chapters of Adam Smith, that a, a nucleus of production and places of consumption, right, they coordinate new products. There is a theory producing sub economy that is used by the manipulation, the people who are manipulating materials and producing new materials. And, the, and there is an economy of new practices, new materials, new reactions, new reaction pathways. And the two interact with each other. Then, then uh, maybe I'm more confused. Are you talking about economy, the, the marketplace of the society, or are you talking about um, something much more theoretical? Uh, and then how are you counting production and how are you counting consumption? Um, yeah, so, 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 so in Adam Smith's uh, description and uh, in sort of a conceptual analysis of the market, the market is where different kinds of producers get co-regulated. 
right? Somebody who's producing metal and somebody who's producing metal-based devices for somebody else to consume. So if you were in Adam Smith's time, a wheelwright producing horse carts and you were, and you were also somebody, an ironsmith producing the right kind of metal, the two would co-regulate each other at the marketplace. So the marketplace is the is not exactly where coordination happens. It's where the metal from the ironsmith gets modified correctly so that it serves the purpose of the wheel of a cart. And so I am, that's why I'm referring it the economy that there is interaction between the theory producers and practice producers, material practice producers. Jose is raising his hand and I think I've just crossed the line, 30 minutes. Okay, <laughs> Michelle, thank you for your question okay. and thank you everybody for the questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.